Beach Boys fans seem to fall into two categories. Most people just think of them as the peppy, surfy sing-along music from our childhood. Maybe our parents would play them in the car. Goofy songs like Fun 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 and Surfing USA. And that's not an invalid way of appreciating their music. But I want to talk about the other camp. The Beach Boys diehards like me. If you haven't already heard their 1966 album Pet Sounds, then you've probably had a musically inclined friend tell you something like, What the f***? Or, It's the greatest album of all time, bro! They use this kind on Pet Sounds, you know Pet Sounds. These are the original keys used on Pet Sounds. In this short video essay, I'm going to try to clearly explain what made Brian Wilson and the Beach Boys such a phenomenon, and why there seems to be a kind of reverence about their music among artists and musicians. I'm also going to try to not make this just a love letter to my favorite band. Without going too deeply into detail, basically what you need to know about the Beach Boys history is that they were a family band, and that they were originally managed by their horribly abusive father, Murray Wilson. He was not a nice guy. My dad was a very, very hostile, messed up man with a lot of hatred in him. He would yell at us if he heard us talking at night. He would open the door and he'd slam the door open real loud and, you kids get to sleep or I'll beat the hell out of you. Get in the bathroom, get in the bathroom. Wham, wham! And he used to beat me in the ass, you know, it really, really, really hurt my feelings. It's believed he even caused Brian's deafness in the right ear by striking him in the side of the head with a two by four as a toddler. Yup, look it up. But he did introduce Brian to both the piano and the music business. He himself was a failed Hollywood hitmaker. But Brian was going down his own path. From a young age, he was obsessed with duop bands like the Penguins and the Four Freshmen. He's even quoted as saying Bob Flanagan taught him how to sing falsetto. It's deeper, dear, by far than any ocean. I find that day by day you're making all my dreams come true. Sorry, I just love that song. Anyways, young Brian began imitating those complex duop harmonies and teaching them to his brothers and friends. Next, they heard rhythm and blues, which in the early 60s was exploding all over the country. Carl and I used to listen to rhythm and blues records. The more we listen, the more we learn, you know. And then along comes Chuck Berry. All over St. Louis and down in New Orleans, all the cats gonna dance with sweet little 16. You'll catch a soup in this inside, outside, you enter a county line. I wonder if someone could still be sued for that. Anyways, once they combine this new fad of R&B and electric guitars with Brian's unique gift for jazz and doo-wop harmonies, you basically have the essential Beach Boys formula at its core. Cars, girls, and surfing were their main subject matter, and they became a massive overnight sensation. Dennis became a sex symbol, but not so much Brian. It's a wonderful treat for me tonight to have heard and seen the Beach Boys. And as you can hear in the background, the girls are still hollering for them. I'm quite pleased to present to you two of them, Brian Wilson on my right and Carl Wilson, his brother, on the left. When you write a song, uh, what gives you the um, incentive to write them? I love music and I get very inspired, just generally creative anyway, right. you know, and I, I understand. shoot all the time. Um, uh, name some of them that you've written, Brian. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, starting with the uh, surfing. This is essentially when they wrote all their hits, single-handedly creating surf rock. But even in these early, somewhat simple years, you start to hear this underlying complexity in Brian's music trying to break through. And the further and further into the 60s you go, you start to hear it. And she knows me too well, our latest hit records. As they grew older, they naturally wrestled control of the band away from Murray Wilson, and more and more authorship was given over to Brian. It was the 1960s, so naturally I have to show you footage of Vietnam and student demonstrations. Yeah, here's MLK. But in reality, Brian did start taking drugs at this time, and I won't make the argument either way over the extent to which his drug use helped or hindered the Pet Sounds era, because literally everything in his life was changing. We were told about this group from England. He pit himself in a production race against the Beatles. He quit touring to be a full-time producer and songwriter. And he was a damn good one. 
You see, unlike the Beatles who were produced by master engineer George Martin and also collaborated within the group, Brian was completely by himself, often producing, writing, arranging, and performing on each track. He was so prolific in the 1960s that he even became a producer for Capitol Records, making hit records for Jan and Dean and other groups. Still not focused on being a rock star, he was taking after his idol, producer Phil Spector. I wanted to do something good like Phil Spector. Well, on Pet Sounds, which is uh, an interpretation of the Phil Spector recording style, or uh, utilizing instruments, combining, say, pianos with guitars to form a unique instrument. In other words, if you combine them electronically well enough, you're not going to have a guitar or a piano. You're going to have piano guitar, a new instrument. If you use two pianos and two guitars, it's going to be more profound. In the 40s and 50s, arrangements were considered, okay, here, listen to that French horn, or let's listen to this string section now. You know what I mean? It was all a definite sound. There weren't combinations of sound. I wanted to take the wall of sound and do my own thing with it and try a new wall of sound. The story goes is that when the other Beach Boys returned from a 1966 tour of Japan, they found that Brian had used studio musicians to produce an entire album of radically new music that was unlike any Beach Boys record they had ever heard, or anybody had heard for that matter. The label didn't know what to make of it, his brothers didn't know what to make of it, even the studio musicians he organized to record it didn't know what to make of it. But once he cut it all together... <sighs> It's easy to take for granted how groundbreaking this was, given the barrage of advanced production techniques he used in today's music. But at the time, this blew people's minds. They had never heard music like this before. It was the first time anyone put the theremin in a rock song. It featured cellos and wood blocks, timpanis and sleigh bells. People didn't know if it was a classical record or a rock record, and the idea that something could be both was radically new. Still think these guys started that? But I think the big influence was uh, Pet Sounds, hmm. Beach Boys. That was the album Flip Me. Still does actually. Still one of my favourite albums of all time. Just because the musical invention on that is like, wow. So that was the big thing for me. I just thought, oh dear me, this is the album of all time. What the hell are we gonna do? So my ideas took off from that standard. I wanted to do stuff beyond that. Pet Sounds draws on all kinds of different genres, like Exotica. Calypso folk, and even classical motifs inspired by Gershwin and Bach. On paper, the music was advanced and complex. It featured unusual jazz and avant-garde arrangements with strange polyrhythms, but somehow it simultaneously sounded poppy and extremely catchy. People could relate to the lyrics. Music critics were calling this the first true concept album, the first rock record that was made not to be danced to, but explicitly to be listened to. Art rock. Other pretentious definitions. But seriously, it's hard to understate the impact of that album. And Good Vibrations, their million-selling follow-up single. Marijuana helped me write Pet Sounds. Upper pills, Benzedrine. It really didn't work out so well. It's a very bad drug. The LSD. The cocaine. We got stoned and we were going... Where is this stuff? What, what's going on here? It shattered my mind. It kind of grew my head up a little bit. Are you, are you saying that um, drugs both helped the creativity but also created the conditions where you couldn't release that record? Right. It's a tough one to reconcile. The deep-seated psychological issues caused by years of abuse at the hands of his father were compounded by his excessive drug use and indulgent lifestyle. He ballooned up to 300 pounds, and ultimately he faded into the background of the band. His brothers continued to put out records. Meanwhile, Brian opened a vitamin store, stayed in bed for two years, and for decades he was held hostage by an insane therapist, Eugene Landy. Despite what a lot of people say, there were some good songs here and there.
but they were few and far between. And for years, Brian's creativity languished under Eugene Landy. Oh, God, no. Yeah, didn't you know that? And even since he's gained his freedom and made a return to music, it's easy to look at his life as just a sad story of mental illness and drugs. And it happens to a lot of people and a lot of families, which, uh, which is a tragedy. It really is, especially when you imagine all the music that could have been. Despite what the average listener may think, Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys was leading the charge of musical revolution in the 1960s. And it's difficult when people only identify his music with Surfing USA or Barbara Ann. Like the Beach Boys were just a joke band, or nothing but the Beatles Jr., who never rose to the same height of sophistication as their counterparts. And I'm not saying you have to like the Beach Boys over the Beatles, or that you should even compare the two. It's just interesting when you look at the legacy of a band. Some become immortalized as icons of musical advancement, and others get relegated to the footnotes of embarrassing karaoke performances. But frankly, music history is full of Brian Wilsons, artists who anticipate the massive trends before they caught on, or found themselves hopelessly lost in the middle of them. Whoa!